Welcome to Health Centers on the Front Lines, the podcast of the National Association of Community Health Centers. Today is the second in a three episode series we're doing about an epidemic that the nation's health centers have been battling for decades, HIV and AIDS. During these episodes, we're sharing promising news about how community health centers, health center controlled networks and primary care associations are employing the latest strategies to link people to ongoing HIV prevention, treatment and care services. Today, we're happy to be joined by a panel of experts, Jeremiah Johnson, who is the program manager at Prep for All, an organization of professionals and patients based in New York City who advocate for greater access to life-saving medication for HIV. Also joining us is Amy Killily, JD, an expert in policy, medication access, and healthcare financing to develop sustainable HIV and hepatitis programs. And Dr. Aviva Cantor, HIV specialist and primary care provider at Callan Lord Community Health Center, which serves New York City's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. So in late 2021, the U.S. public was introduced to a bi-monthly injectable form of PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Taken in pill form and now also available as an injectable, this medication reduces the chance of getting HIV from sex or injection drug use. When taken as prescribed, PrEP is highly effective for preventing HIV, a landmark push to end the HIV epidemic. At the same time, people living with HIV have been introduced to a monthly injectable form of treatment that similarly puts them in charge of their healthcare needs without having to remind themselves to take a daily oral medication. This is revolutionizing the field of treatment and prevention of HIV because we never have had a form of either that was this long lasting. Also, it's exciting news because it expands the number of tools we have in our hands to fight HIV. Health centers have been taking their first steps in implementing these tools. So starting with our health center guest, Aviva, can you explain to our audience the two types of in injectable antiretroviral medication? We've heard that one can be used as PrEP for people who are HIV negative, and the other as an HIV treatment for people who are living with HIV. Can you tell us about the similarities and differences? Sure. Yeah. So the two medications, and we'll use brand names here. I, I normally don't like to use brand names, but we'll we'll use them when so that they're more clear for for patients in the community. So one is called Cabinuva. That's the medication that's used for HIV treatment, and the other is called Apertude. That is the medication that's used for HIV prevention. What they both have in common are that they are both. Uh, what I describe to patients and my colleagues as deep intramuscular injections. So they're a little different than your regular intramuscular injections. They have to be done by nurses who have been trained just a little bit differently to make sure they, they, they do it the right way. So they're both these deep intramuscular injections. They're actually both now available as bi-monthly or every two-month injections. Um, they actually sort of follow the same schedule where you're given your initial injection, you're given one one month later as a loading dose, and then you take an injection uh, every two months, every eight weeks, essentially. The big difference between these medications is, um, first, well, first of all, for HIV treatment, it's two. It's a combination of two medications. Um, and for, so it's two separate injections, one in each buttock, one medication in each buttock for HIV treatment, for apertude, for prevention, it's just the one injection um, in one buttock. Yeah, that's a good first start. We can get, we can get back <laughs> to some of those issues in, in more depth. Uh, Jeremiah, drawing from your experience as a community member and advocate, what do you think is important for the community health centers that we represent around the country to know and consider as they see these new options for prevention and treatment? Yeah, happy to, to talk about that. And thanks for having me on the podcast today. And um, really, you know, I think Dr. Cantor, you really set us up really well because I think um, you clearly have a, a clear uh, sort of centering of your patients and the way that you're sort of talking about things. Um, because I, I think one of the, the you know, first things that I'll say about long-acting injectable is it is exciting, 
Um, I also, as a community advocate, am very cognizant of the price issue with this. So when you're looking at $22,500 a year for Aptitude compared to less than $20 a month for generic TDF-FTC or generic Truvada, um, this is going to be a complicated intervention to get to people. And I do worry as a community advocate given that, the, you know, there's such important adherence um, requirements if you're going to be on this, um, that, uh, you know, community health centers are checking with patients and really making sure that they're not going to run into any sort of unexpected coverage issues um, or anything that's going to interrupt their ability to uh, continue with their treatment in terms of all of this. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I, I like to put out there in these sorts of conversations is that, uh, you know, sometimes I think we get really excited about the the new modality. We get excited about the new way to sort of put things out there um, and forget the old classics, you know. And in this case, we have, you know, new sort of access to these generic medications that can be more nimble in a complicated healthcare system to get to people. And we can be more creative in terms of getting that out to people. And so, um, you know, one thing that we're working a lot here at, at Prep for All right now is to try and build a national prep program, calling for a federal program with centralized uh, reimbursement of uh, laboratory costs and medications, particularly for uninsured and underinsured individuals. Thank you. Some really good points there. Uh, I want to turn it to Amy. Um, as health centers consider delivering delivering these services, what are the financial or policy hurdles that they need to be aware of? Yeah, so I think this is a, a really a really good question, and um, and you know the 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 short answer is that there there are a lot. Um, so I think the the first one is that the and this was has been mentioned several times the the price of the drug and combined with the fact that it is a provider administered injectable product, so that is just a different administration route than the the vast majority of the the antiretrovirals that are available right now. Um, and, and those two things, you know, both both apart and combined do, I think, um, add some complexity to the, the finances and, and the, the procurement and delivery of the both um, Apertude and um, Cabinuva. And, and, you know, I'm going to go through some of these these challenges and, and, and note throughout that the, the challenges are different depending on what population you're talking about, whether the population is insured or uninsured. So I'm going to try to underscore what some of those differences look like. Um, and, you know, the, the, the number one piece, um, and, and sort of tie this specifically for community health centers, so that the price of, of both drugs was raised. Um, and it is, it is you know, a, a pretty, it could be higher, right? But, but in the grand scheme of things, over $22,000 a year for a list price for an ARV um, is, is in the, the upper threshold of ARVs that are available for HIV treatment and prevention. So it's, it's not an insignificant list price. If we talk about um, community health centers and their status as 340B entities, there's a discount available to purchase that drug for your uninsured population. Uh, and yet, even with the discount, the price is still fairly significant. So that's an important factor as community health centers look at budgeting and programmatic decisions on both routes, on both um, Apertude and Cabinuva. Um, and when we talk about the insured, I think even now when these products have been on the market and available, you know, in, in the case of, of Apertude for, um, you know, a little less than a year and for Cabinuva longer than that, we still have sort of complexity challenges and, and murkiness, I would say, with regard to payer behavior for insured clients. Um, you know, on the PrEP side, we don't have a U.S. Preventative Services Task Force grade for long-acting cabotegravir. The grade A that we have is based on the oral products for PrEP. We are waiting for a U.S. PSTF grade, and that would carry with it a requirement that the vast majority of payers cover uh, long-acting cabotegravir aptitude without, without cost-sharing. Thank you. Aviva, would you like to add to that in terms of considerations that other community health centers who are, who are considering offering these should, should factor in? Yeah, I mean, Amy brought up a lot of things that um, we are currently dealing with. I, I present on um, on PrEP and on, on long-acting medications for PrEP and HIV a lot. And I have this slide that shows like how incredibly excited we are for these medications to be here. And then the next slide is just total chaos because that's what it feels like. 
Um, it's sort of like, hold up, wait, yes, we're excited, but let's be realistic about this. This is really hard. It's really hard right now. You know, you need the people to do the work, but you also need the funding to pay the people. And it's just, you, you can't make it up. You know, these are federally qualified health centers. We're already running on a really tight budget with nursing shortages, provider shortages, and um, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of administrative work. It's a lot of you know, wait lists, which, you know, not, not just having wait lists, but communicating about the wait list to your staff, to the patients themselves who are eagerly waiting for these medications. Um, and then within those wait lists, there is, you know, who's going to get outreached. And, you know, some of, some of our patients um, are difficult to outreach. So sometimes you have to do a lot of outreach to get people in. And then you sort of question, is this the kind of person who's going to be able to keep these really important appointments? Because then this might be a person who requires outreach at every single visit that they're scheduled for. All of this requires a lot of work. And you this isn't the kind of thing where when somebody misses an appointment, you can say, oh, well, these people need to come back in or they need to be counseled about the risks of not coming back in for um, for a follow up injection. And I don't mean anything sort of terrible, but the risks of, you know, for someone who's living with HIV, they'll have that medication in their body for the next year or for, for both these medications. They'll have the medication the medication at certain levels, you know, for up to a year. And what is that what does that mean if you're not taking any other medications after you stop the long acting injectable? This is for HIV treatment. And um, you could become resistant to the two medications that are in Cabinuva, for example. What's your sense of how widely um, health centers are offering the treatment and the and the pre- prevention? That's a great question. So we have, you know, and I want to be honest about our numbers, we have um, a fairly r- robust practice. I've heard of people who have many more people, but we have around 50 people on Cabinuva. I mean, we have a wait list of at least 40. Um, and for Apertude, we only have about five or six people because we had a lot of delays getting people started and a wait list of around 80. Um, I mean, people are really interested. I know that's not your your, your question. But um, well, we have had some people, you know, now we're, now because Cabinuva has been around for a while, we've had a couple of people who have transferred care and they're already on Cabinuva. So we've had to sort of handle those last minute, oh, they're here. We need to make sure that we have their coverage. So we've had that. But now we've also had people who are interested in transferring their care to other places. So that's where I wanted to bring this up. We had a patient um, who wanted to transfer to a geriatrician at a big hospital in Manhattan. And that Practice does not do Cabinuva at any of their sites. Um, And that's probably a choice they're making based on the kind of resources they have and how much, you know, what would be required to do that. I can't speak for them, but that's just one big hospital. I can say that some of the other federally qualified health centers are doing it. I don't know how big their practices are, but we're getting their referrals to us of those patients transferring their care. So I know it's happening in other places. Amy or Jeremiah, do you want to add your thoughts on considerations that you would share with people who are trying to decide whether or not it's right for them? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that it, it is important for patients to to take into account everything that Dr. Cantor is, is describing, you know, which is that, you know, this may not be a quick in and out to get a shot, that if, you know, you're looking to, to carry this to another sort of setting, you know, that, you know, uh, the number of sites that are willing to sort of do these sorts of injections all of this is sort of being rolled out right now. So, you know, if someone's willing to sort of be, you know, a pioneer and and explore it and, and, you know, be part of this brave new world with everybody, you know, I think that's great, you know, and if this is something that is just gonna work significantly better for you, you know, if you're someone who's in a situation where you really can't keep a bottle of pills around for daily oral, I I, I talk about prep uh, a lot because I'm at prep for all, um, you know, you know, it's understandable that this might be something that it's worth that time and that investment, but it's important to really sort of consider it. Well, I think the the next question that I was going to ask you, I think we've sort of covered, but what are the issues you think health centers should be on the lookout for as they set up or adjust their PrEP and HIV programs? Are there, are there any aspects, factors that we haven't covered already? I- I mean, one thing I, I will just say very, very quickly is that, you know, I, I will remind us as we go through this evolution, don't forget about the tremendous opportunity of having, you know, a generic TDF FTC available, you know, and, and for us right now, 
really contributing to the advocacy for a national prep program. If, if anyone's interested, we're doing a lot of work with that at Prep for All, Jeremiah at prepforall.org. And we're happy to connect with you and have as many voices as possible within that. Because um, I don't think we want to lose that opportunity, you know, and I think that there are real chances. There are things that we haven't scaled up very well, you know, like on demand prep, you know, we have a TDF FTC for um, people for, for rectal exposures, you know, that's a really great option that I don't know that we have completely talked about and scaled up in all sorts of situations. Um, we still haven't scaled up post exposure prophylaxis very well. So as we're talking about the new and the evolution, I think it's also a great time to sort of look at, at what is there um, already and, and make sure that we're capitalizing on all of that going forward. Uh, Amy and Aviva, you want to add anything to that? Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I, I would I would agree and second everything that Jeremiah said. And I think, you know, for, for community health centers out there, I mean, I, I think it is twofold. I think it is first, we have to have a, an optimistic and hopeful vision for public health. We have a broken system. We're operating within a broken healthcare system and a broken and woefully underfunded public health system, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I, and I think that there are legislative and other proposals out there that, that we should all sort of join, join arms and, and get behind because until we fix the broken system, we're not, we're not going to see the, the numbers that, that we want to see in terms of people accessing these newer interventions. You could, you could have the best intervention in the entire world. And we do, we have a pill and now an injectable that prevents HIV. We have an, a medication that prevents HIV and very few people are taking it. So I think we, we can all day long talk about these new things coming down the pipeline and be very, very excited about injectables. And we are, I am, but um, we, haven't, we haven't fixed the fundamental flaws in the financing, delivery and access systems. And until we do, do that, I think we are just going to be talking about growing disparities in who's able to really, you know, thread these very complex systems to, to get them. Um, I would just, my, my two cents here are that they either need to be ready to hire somebody or to carve out time of, of people's schedules to do this. And I think the biggest thing is, I think, um, I think people are afraid to start. Like, and I mean the healthcare centers. And so my biggest thing would be just write that first prescription and then see how it goes. I mean, I think that people are sort of totally overwhelmed by everything that they've heard. But it, I mean, even us, it was one patient at a time and testing out each insurance and, you know, following that process and um, taking lots of notes. Um, but just really like just just one prescription at a time. Thank you. Are there any any considerations or advice you, you would give um, all three of you uh, to health centers who are really trying to make sure that there isn't the disparity in who gets, who gets access to these um, types of outreach or support services? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing, um, particularly with Appertude, um, is we're, we're having people when they refer their patients to us is to give us an indication as to the reason why we could prioritize them. And um, we're really trying to make sure that uh, specifically with a focus on our sex workers, on people that just absolutely positively um, cannot swallow pills and are you know at continued risk, our young people, we have a big adolescent program, you know, people that, um, that really are struggling with very easy to access oral prep um, or for whatever reason, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there are people who should not do on-demand prep, which is a great option for people who maybe don't want to take pills every day, but sort of making sure that, that those people who this essentially directly observed therapy is really the best option for it. So we're trying to make sure that we have sort of indications for those people to prioritize them. Well, we will definitely put, uh, at a link to prep for all in the show notes. So people who want to follow up and, um, help advocate, we'll know where to go. Uh, Amy and Aviva, if you have any links that you want to add to the show notes, you can send them to us and we'll make sure they get in there for people. Um, I just want to thank you all for your time and lending us your insights um, and explaining this really important, complex topic to our audience. If you like this episode, please rate it, subscribe, and share it with your network. 
Health Centers on the Front Lines is a podcast series brought to you by the National Association of Community Health Centers, a strategic partner in the Technical Assistance Provider Innovation Network. The Technical Assistance Provider Innovation Network is a project of Chickatelli Associates, Inc., funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HIV AIDS Bureau. To learn more, visit targethiv.org. Produced by HeartCast Media.